and organ protection. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, to get this uh, squeezed in seven or ten minutes will be very difficult, so I limited myself a little bit. And I want to start with, again, it was already mentioned by a lot of people, the importance of controlling anemia. Because anemia is not only having an impact on the uh, coagulation, but it also has a major impact on end organ functioning. And that means that we not only have to look to the real absolute value, but also to the value when the patient is entering the hospital on one hand. And on the other hand, we also have to think about when we are transfusing the patient. Because what we have learned that maybe in some cases we should transfuse earlier in order to prevent massive transfusion later. So if we look to the hematocrit, we did a great job as perfusionists. This was the situation in 2005, and this is the situation today. As you can see, we went up from an average hematocrit from about 22 to a, an average hematocrit of 30 during the majority of all procedures done. So this means that the message also coming from MIEC that we should reduce priming volume has been understood and has been realized in most centers. And this meant that it became a lot easier to generate a certain inflow towards the organs, meaning we could maintain more easily an oxygen delivery which was above a certain limit. And we have learned from Marco Ranucci that this actually has an attenuation of renal failure in a given patient. So meaning inflow condition is important because it makes no sense that if you do not have enough energy towards the kidney, for example, to stimulate the kidney because you will further uh, aggravate the negative effects. And that means that although we can do that, we still have a major flown. And the major flown is that it doesn't give us an idea on the local organ. Because if you look to the kidney, that's extremely sensitive to a reduction in hematocrit. Whereas the heart tolerates that much better and the gut is somewhere in between. So meaning that we really need more information on the microcirculation and by preference online during the procedure. And to show you that, this is a very interesting study which was performed in, um, in Sweden. And as you can see, they can maintain the, um, the oxygen delivery during the procedure without any problem. They do not have a major reduction in hemoglobin. They have uh, a good maintenance of arterial pressure. But nevertheless, you, you will see that at the kidney itself, although the systemic one is maintained, we have a reduction, which is mainly due to the fact that we have a higher extraction. So this means, if this is important, why can hematocrit make the difference? And there are some new insights now because we, we like to simplify things and say the microcirculation is something like a vessel with some tissue around it. But in reality, it's a very complex uh, system, as we have seen from some of the other presentations. And that means that if we have a normal situation and we have sufficient hematocrit, we have a high oxygenated kern center in the, in the blood vessel, and then when we have a side vessel, part of that will go to that area. But it means if we have vasoconstriction, that mainly we probably give lower oxygenated blood towards that tissue. And if we have vasodilation, we all know the beneficial effects of that, we have a better distribution of oxygenated blood towards this system. But we have learned now that there is a very interesting mechanism based on the hematocrit, which actually will be able to sense when there is oxygen lack at that region. And by doing that, it will release ATP, which then will give a, a, a local vasodilatation. So meaning that part of the explanation why we see so much better results is not only because we have a better systemic oxygen delivery, but we also have an impact on the regional level. And that means giving enough oxygen, that's one thing. But probably as deleterious or even worse is when we increase, increase congestion. And congestion is often not measured because we just assume that we have a good venous return. And this means that if we look to this uh, experimental study where they did or an occlusion of the artery, the mesenteric artery, or the venous uh, side of the same area, that there could be a huge difference. And as you can see, lactate, if you look systemically, there is not a lot of difference whether we have arterial uh, occlusion, so it would be not enough supply, or whether we have congestion. But if we look to the local situation, you can see that congestion is much worse for this tissue than actually have, having a reduced supply. So that means, and I really like this slide from Ken Ince, 
that we majorly have two major mechanisms. We have a convection limitation, which we should avoid. This is flow, this is oxygen delivery, but we also have a diffusion limitation, which can exist because we have congestion or we have too much anemia. And both of them will lead to an increased complication rate. And that means if we look, for example, to uh, mini bypass versus conventional bypass, that in general you will have higher flows during conventional bypass because of limitations to cannulas, that at the end it doesn't make a difference, as you can see here, because the convection and diffusion balance out and we get an optimal um, uh, oxygen delivery. But as we are looking to values, they are all very nice, but what is very often forgotten is the very important factor of time. I really believe that we should look like uh, uh, John Merkin was saying, also on maintaining pressure in the autologous region. And maintaining the pressure, we can do that now mainly offline. It's, it's rather difficult to do it uh, online. But what is very important is to maintain it as long as possible in this region. And this is not only true for pressure, but it's also true for oxygen delivery. It's true for avoiding congestion. And as you can see, when they maintain this in, uh, 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 in this autologous region, they have a drastic reduction in major comorbidity in the patient. And then we have to go back to coagulation, because it was mentioned already a few times, but I do not fully agree with some of the comments made. What we have to keep in mind, if we give heparin, we actually will activate the platelets. And if we activate the platelets, we make them prone for thrombin generation because it's a massive substrate for thrombin generation. We also know that due to the uh, formulation of heparin, the, apparently we have now some brands which have some of the moieties of the heparin which are more activating than others' platelets, which is very, very difficult to, to look for. And that means if we have a lot of thrombin, this has a negative impact on organ function. So we have to keep in mind if we do not control the coagulation, we actually also jeopardize organ function. Also important and also related to cardiopulmonary bypass is, not, is the uh, amount of hemolysis. And I want to say if we <coughs> keep type 1, type 2, type 3, it's probably not a big issue. But starting from type 4, we actually will reduce some of the suction blood inside the coagulation. This blood has very high amounts of thrombin, it has low concentrations of heparin, and it has a high concentration of hemolysis. And if we look to the impact of that, you can see here, it has an immediate impact not only on the endothelium by capturing nitric oxide, so it gives a high systemic resistance, but even worse, it also increases the pulmonary vascular resistance. And probably we should give in those patients where we return this blood, nitric oxide under the form of a pharmacological donor or by a gaseous uh, administration through the oxygenator in order to um, in inhibit this negative effect. And finally, to conclude, I think we have to maintain in order to preserve uh, organ function optimal delivery. And that's something we can discuss whether we should do that because what we live from, uh, learned from the GIFT study is that although we had a better oxygen delivery and a lower uh, renal failure, we had the same amount of transfusion. The only difference was that the transfusion was given much earlier during the procedure and that instead of giving it on intensive care or immediately after cardiopulmonary bypass, that now it was more given at the end or during cardiopulmonary bypass, and by doing that, we actually had a better organ outcome. We certainly should avoid congestion, and there I think there is a real issue on most of the venous cannula, because if you look to a lot of venous cannula, they have a lot of holes, but it means the blood has to go up and down at the same time, which is not a very uh, a good um, um, re, um, decompression of, for example, abdominal organs. And we could really think about, for example, the smart cannula, where it has been shown because the open structure that we have a better uh, avoidance of congestion if we shouldn't work on that. Then we should try to optimize the balance between giving energy and actually uh, how we do that. Do we do it by mainly convective or a combination which is probably more con uh, convenient of convective and diffusion parameters. And finally, I would strongly recommend that we should work on controlling hemostasis. I'd never understood why we are just looking at anti-10A activity, because that's very important 
but as important is what is the impact of the anti-10A uh, inhibition on the thrombin formation. And that's quite different. We know that from low molecular weight heparins that they have a different way in inhibiting thrombin. And we should really look in there and find better ways in uh, controlling this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Philip. That was really a very good uh, overview of the organ and specifically for renal dysfunction, which has a huge morbidity and mortality. Um, just, just to enhance the discussion a little bit further, most of the tests that we have for uh, assessing and evaluating renal function are very crude. Do you have a, <coughs> any experience of using very sensitive micro tests, uh, NGAL or anything like that, that would identify much earlier than an established uh, renal dysfunction? Uh, we have used them, and we have still some studies running, but the problem is most of them are very expensive. It's difficult to get them on a regular basis, so in study uh, we can have them, it, it's not an issue, but to get them routinely, uh, at least in our hospital, that's more of an issue. But I certainly believe there is some, uh, some additional value. The only question is uh, which one would then be the best. I don't think it will be a single value, but there are now some combined tests. I think that's probably the future. But I think it's a little bit too early. There are some studies running, uh, and I would be very interested to see what is the results or the relationship with those tests with renal outcome. Yes. Yes, Ken. <coughs> um, <clears throat> uh, we've been developing a contrast enhanced ultrasound for looking at uh, renal hemodynamics. Mm. And uh, what's very interesting parameter which we got out of that is to look at the difference between the flow characteristics of bubbles going through the arterioles in relationship to the microcirculation. Really? And then you can look at a delta T, which is the intrarenal transit time. And that's turning out to be a very sensitive parameter for uh, indicating whether there's renal failure or not. Well, that's very interesting. I mean, again, a very investigative tool, and I think what we are really trying to look for is an everyday usable tool. You're quite right. The sensitivity of these tests, the area under the curve, which is sensitive and specific, uh, but that's very interesting. Does anybody else have any comments or views I, or discussion points? Just yes, a brief please. comment of something I heard recently at a meeting in Leicester. They use intravenous uh, sildenafil based on a lot of... Um, experimental evidence and it was wonderful to prevent renal dysfunction unfortunately it raised so much troponin and <laughs> it didn't do too much good to the heart the yes I, I think the question is that should we use sildenafil for that or should we for example just administer nitric oxide in the oxygenator like they did in australia where they also saw a beneficial effect in, in pediatrics then uh, by doing so so I think we should readdress, I think it's nitric oxide which makes the difference. So why sh making it more complex than it is uh, necessary? <coughs> I think yeah. it's just a balance of uh, yeah, yeah, access to nitric oxide, scavenged nitric oxide, and the dosage levels for sildenafil which were in question. But if there is not more, we will move to the next presentation by Cyril on